Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studio B with another Watchman video broadcast. Last week, we started a new sub-series of the series, Matthew chapter 24, the signs that Jesus gave that we were approaching our blessed hope. The day when Jesus, I believe, is going to appear in the air and take us home to be with him. But he said there are things that are going to happen before that day. We were looking at, we've, we spent time looking at the beginning of sorrows and take heed that no man deceive you, which glad to say many of you took that advice. Last week, we started talking about his warning of not just religious figures standing up and not just it, some big universal religion. He mentioned specifically that there would be fake, phony, feigned, fraudulent Christs. How's that for F's? So anyway, here's what he said. Matthew 24, verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise, notice this, false Christs, plural, and false prophets. Like in Revelation 13, we have the rise of the Antichrist in Revelation 13, and false prophets. Like in Revelation 13, he mentions the rise of the beast, the Antichrist, in Revelation 13, and the rise of the false prophet. So let's say that before the big honcho false Jesus shows up, there are a bunch of false Jesus, 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 I, G, G, many, many Jesuses rising up and many false prophets showing up and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Again, the very elect will not be deceived. Behold, I've told you before. That means read the rest of the Bible because he told us before, like in Genesis. Yeah, that was Jesus. Exodus, Jesus. Leviticus, Jesus. Numbers, Jesus, Deuteronomy, Jesus, all, all the way through the Old Testament, all the rest of the Old Testament, all the rest of the New Testament is telling us what to look for, who to spot, how to spot them, like a field guide for Boy Scouts or a hunter's guide on what not to shoot in the woods. If it's wearing orange, don't shoot it. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now that thing about east and west is going to play into this, what we're going to see today. Now, we went from there to 2 Corinthians 11 very quickly. Paul said, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, that goes along with what Jesus said about many false Christs shall come whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And I've been saying all these years that if someone or you invents a different Jesus, then you will have a different spirit and you will have along with it. And it doesn't matter what Jesus you invent. If it's a different Jesus than what's in this Bible, then it's going to be a different spirit. The Bible talks about the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth. What is truth? Jesus said in John 17, thy word is truth. So the spirit of God will always agree with the words that are in this book. 
And if your Jesus or the Jesus that somebody else invented doesn't match word for word the Jesus in this book, think of it like this. You got two Jesus and both of them are identical. I mean, in like every way. And you're looking like, I can't figure it out. Then you notice, like right here, a mole, just a little bitty mole, which is like a spot, right? And you're going, that's got a spot. Jesus is unspotted. He's the unspotted lamb. That can't be Jesus. And again, there's only, you know, let's just in this imaginary thing, there's only one difference between the two. Does that spot matter? Yes, it does. This is why I've been telling you, know this book, have the spirit of truth, not only in the book, but in your heart. And when Jesus talked about in John, the spirit of truth, he said that spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. So you don't have to be the smartest guy in the room and know every verse in the Bible by heart. You just have to have that spirit of truth in your heart guiding you as you read this book. You have to believe it. And I guarantee you, if you believe this book, you'll be talking to somebody verses that come flying out of you that you're going, where in the world did that come from? I never memorized that verse. The spirit of truth knew it and he's in your heart. And that's what Jesus told us would happen. Okay. So anyway, back to this, another Jesus whom we've not preached. So he tells us in Matthew 24, other Christ's plural. He warns us here, second Corinthians 11, another Jesus and another gospel and another spirit. They're all a package. They all go together. Then we noted that John was the only guy for some reason, God, the Holy Spirit gave John the word Antichristos, the Antichrist, because only John says it. First John 2, 18, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. That was 2000 years ago when he said that. If there were Antichrists back then, you think they went away over the last 2000 years? I think they increased over the last 2000 years, like rabbits. First John 2, 22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the father and the son. First John 4, 3, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come of the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. Second John 1, 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now remember, our two Jesus standing here. One of them's the real one. He's the unspotted and unblemished. The other one has that little, there's a reason why I said a mole, right? Because I've got one. Let's see, where is it? It's right here. I got a little tiny little little bump right here and it's, it's my birthmark it came from my mother my mother used to have a significantly larger one here she had it removed okay so that's how you tell it's the real me I got a little bump right there anyway so our fake Jesus he's spotted he is not the real Jesus he's a fake one he is anti Christ Everything that Christ came to do, which is forgive us freely for our sins and of our sins, freely, without any works of the flesh, without any money, without any tricks or tasks or backflips that we have to do or works of the law, totally free. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you 100%. The fake Jesus, if all there is is a difference between a mole and no mole,
that fake Jesus is going to have some sort of work requirement in order to receive his temporary corrupt version of being born again. Guarantee you. Now, Genesis chapter 3. We've studied this till we're blue in the face, but it gives us the idea behind the false Jesus. What started the gears rolling with this false Jesus thing? Genesis 3. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So, what does that mean? The serpent was more subtle. What it means from what we see in the whole of the Bible, and we kind of went through this last week, people worship Satan right now, but they've been deceived and they think that they're worshiping Jesus. They have been deceived. And you remember when I mentioned that if it's a fake Jesus, then the gospel that goes along with that Jesus with the mole on it, that false gospel is going to require some sort of work. Like with one denomination, it's you must be baptized in our water. That's Church of Christ. With United Pentecostal, you must speak in tongues or you're not saved. Or Lutheran, you must recite the catechism and join the church or you cannot go to heaven. Catholic, you must pray to Mary. You must confess to the priest. You must eat this cookie and drink this intoxicating beverage that we're going to give you. And you have to do it every week or at least four times a year. And then you have to pay us large sums of money. See, all of that is a false gospel. It's a gospel that requires a work of some kind. Usually, the gospel giver is the church and not God. And then you have people all over the internet telling you, well, you got to say Yahushua, or you've got to go to church on Saturday, or you've got to be patriotic. Or you've got, if you go to a doctor, you can't be a real Christian. Or if you wear a mask, you're not really saved. And on and on and on. They invent sins. And they invent requirements for salvation that are not true. Theirs is another Christ. It's a different Jesus because it's a different gospel. The serpent is more subtle than any beast of the field. You never, why did God take the feet and the legs off the serpent? You can't hear him sneaking up to you. You never know a snake's there. He never makes a sound until it's too late. So with that in mind, he said, same serpent, Isaiah 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high. So his goal is to set himself up and the Antichrist so that everybody thinks they're worshiping God, they're worshiping Jesus, but they're not. Now we introduced last week Tammuz of the North. Remember him? Ezekiel 8, 13, he said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. See, Tammuz of the north, right? And where did they get that? It comes from this old, we, I'm not going to cover this again, but Tammuz goes all the way back to Nimrod, Semiramis, the city of Babel, Tower of Babel, that whole kingdom that Nimrod the 13th set up. He is the picture of the dying God. When I mentioned picture, lo and behold, we've got one. Now, this is an artist rendering based upon eyewitness accounts or something like that. So, last week was Tammuz, and I was introducing the biblical concept of the introduction of a false 
Christ, because here they are weeping for Tammuz. They spend 40 days doing it. That's where Lent comes from. No, not Lent, like, you know, from your socks. Lent, the 40 days that Roman Catholics, a lot of the mainline denominations do, some other people do for some unknown reason, even though it's not in the Bible anywhere. But they're told to do it. They're required to do it. And if they don't do it, according to their doctrine, they can't go to heaven. See it? It's already a false Jesus because it's a false gospel. So, this is Tammuz. Remember the crosses that were on his head? Remember what the Catholic priest does? Puts the little ash cross on people's heads? Well, let me show you his Tammuz's twin brother. Well, okay, not, not, not exactly you know, twins. Maybe like, you know, fourth cousins, five times removed, things like that. This is, this is another Jesus. Remember, we're, right now we're dealing with the historical ones. The ones that go, that have been in history where people have worshipped a Jesus-like figure. This one is given the simple name of Quetzalcoatl. Took me years when I was in elementary school to learn how to say that. This is Quetzalcoatl. The word itself, Quetzalcoatl, comes from two words from the ancient, let's see, it was Aztec in Mexico. So the ancient Aztec language, the Quetzal meant feathered or plumed or like a bird flying. The coatl, serpent. Yes, the serpent. They worshipped the serpent. Here's what, and our source for the ancient traditions, even though it's not biblical truth, the search for the ancient myths and traditions, a lot of it that I research comes from Manley Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages. Here is the lies now, and Hall believed this stuff. He believed that even our Jesus from the Bible was a recreation of the dying God myth. That's why I mentioned last week that, uh, that video documentary called Zeitgeist, because it introduced to conspiracy theorist people this idea that if they go to church and they hear about a Jesus dying on the cross and rising again the third day with women weeping for him, then it, that, that was an invented religion. And I'm telling you, there is one true gospel, one true Jesus, and thousands of phonies. Tammuz was a phony. Quetzalcoatl was a phony. Phony. Here's what it says. One of the most remarkable of the crucified world saviors. And let me stop right here. Manly Hall has a whole section in Secret Teachings of All Ages on the dying God. A whole chapter devoted to it. One of the most remarkable of the crucified world saviors is the Central American God of the Winds, or the Sun, Quetzalcoatl, concerning whose activities great secrecy was maintained by the Indian priests of Mexico and Central America. This strange immortal, whose name means feathered snake, appears to have come, get this, out of the sea, dun, 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 bringing with him a mysterious cross. That's a double. Dun, dun, dun. On his garments were embellished clouds and red crosses. In his honor, great serpents carved from stone were placed in different parts of Mexico. Stop right here. Carved images of a serpent. Where does that come? Does that, does that ring a bell with something in the Bible that the Israelites ended up worshiping and offering incense to? We're going to get there. The cross of Quetzalcoatl became a sacred symbol among the Mayas. And according to available records, the Maya Indian angels had crosses of various pigments painted on their foreheads. 
Similar crosses were placed over the eyes of those initiated into their mysteries. They put a cross on their face. Now are you getting it? The Roman Catholic Church didn't read the Bible and say, oh my goodness, in order to honor Christ, we're going to put a cross of, uh, of ashes on our face. They didn't get that from the Bible. They got it from ancient pagan practices. I'm telling you, there's two religions in this world. The religion of the Antichrist, which is witchcraft, works salvation. If you don't do or if you do these things, you can or cannot be saved. Whereas the true religion says, if you believe what God said, then you can have everlasting life. And it's two entire, and don't give me this nonsense, people, about faith being a work. That's a lie. Faith and works are clearly scriptural. Two different things in the Bible. Don't let people on the internet or anybody else remove you away from the simplicity that is in this book about salvation. Don't, I am passionate for this. You start messing with the gospel and who can be saved and who can't, then my feathers get ruffled. I hate false gospels. I hate false ways because they put people in bondage. And I've been in bondage. And God brought me out. And I'm here to warn you, don't go down that path. Similar crosses were placed over the eyes of those initiated into their mysteries. When Cortez, here it is. When Cortez arrived in Mexico, lo and behold, he brought with him the cross. Why? Because Cortez brought a missionary priest from the Catholic Church. Cortez was Spanish. The Catholic Church owned Spain just like they did France and all the other, most of the other European nations at that time, they owned them. They ran them. Okay? So wherever Cortez went, he had a Catholic priest going with him. This Catholic priest comes out wearing this big old cross, carrying this big old staff with a crucified Jesus on it, a crucifix, the idol shepherd, and all of a sudden, the, all the Mayans, Aztecs, are going, Oh, Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl. They fell for it. By the way, in a lot of the myths concerning Quetzalcoatl, Kukulkan, which is another name for him, they said that he had, and you got to understand, the natives that lived in Mexico, Central America, South America, they were quite brown, okay, in their appearance. Very tanned. So here's this pearly white guy and, by the way, they don't grow facial hair very well. Just saying, okay? So off this boat, from the sea, comes a big, pearly white guy with light hair and a beard. Tell me, who does Cortez in your mind look like? Paintings of Jesus. Imagine that. So, they're expecting a God to return, Quetzalcoatl, that in their stories, in the myths that they told around the fire, was this white guy with a beard. And so the white guy with the beard comes off the boat with the cross, and they're going, he's back. That's what, and Cortez knew it. He got the entire kingdom of Montezuma to submit to him because he played the part of Jesus Christ. Wicked, isn't it? Killed those people. There was a war started over that. Blood was shed. All in the name of a fake religion. And that's coming again. When Cortez arrived in Mexico, he brought with him the cross. Recognizing this, the natives believed that he was Quetzalcoatl returned, for the latter had promised to come back in the infinite future and redeem his people. And where did he come from? The sea. Where does the beast rise from? Revelation 13. The sea. Same place. In fact, it's not just the Mayans and the Aztecs, the Incas. 
that had a cross symbol in their religious ideologies before any European came over to the New World. They had it for thousands of years. Even the Native Americans in America, the First Nations people in Canada, they had it. We still see evidence of that today in many of the symbols, the fetishes, the things that Native Americans, First Nations people, they, they try to honor the elders, the old... Basically, it's a religion of dead people. They honor and pray to the elders, which are the spirits of the dead who have died before them. They give them honor, build totem poles, totem poles in their honor, all in the name of the great spirit in the sky that looks like an eagle. Think about that. So here's their symbols. Even in the symbol of the uh, state of New Mexico, it's emblazoned on their flag. All of these are cross symbols. And if you look down at the bottom, you see what the guy's wearing on his headband? It is a stylized cross called the swastika. Where did they get it? Well, the theory is that the people from First Nations, Native Americans, Aztecs, Incans, Mayans, that they migrated from Asia over a land or ice bridge way up north in Alaska and Russia and Siberia and then settled down. They just kept moving down because the swastika was an ancient Persian symbol. It goes back to thousands of years before Christ. It was a symbol of like good luck, but to them luck wasn't like roll the dice, I hope I get a seven. Luck was determined by the gods. It was a symbol of resurrection, a symbol of immortality, the swastika. Why do you think Hitler chose it? Hitler didn't invent the swastika, he stole it. And he used it, he altered it, changed its meaning to be, this is gonna revive the Germanic Teutonic peoples and we're gonna conquer the world in this symbol's name. There's another story that goes along with that. I don't have time to tell today. But that's how I think that swastika ended up way over here. If you go to India now, go to India. Well, don't go to India. But if you go to India, you'll see it everywhere over there. It's on Buddhas. It's on idols. It's carved everywhere. There are pavements that they dug up in ancient Greece that have swastikas in the floor. There are buildings, the um, House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. was built in the 30s before World War II. When you go into the lobby of that thing, you'll see swastikas in the, um, it's like a, it's not a wallpaper, but in the designs all around the crown molding of that building, I've taken pictures of it, there's swastikas all joined together in there. That was pre-World War II that was built in the 30s. So that's where that symbol came from. It's not the cross of Jesus Christ, people. It is a satanic evil symbol of Satan's form of rebirth. And it's about the rebirth of the dying God. So here you have a temple in central Mexico called Chichen Itza. It's yes, it's a step pyramid. It's a high place. And according to Manley Hall and many other scholars, Kukulkan was the Mayan version of Quetzalcoatl, which also means feathered serpent. So notice that, and I've made mention of this before, notice in this pyramid, you see that the sun is shining on one side of the pyramid. And notice the step corners of the corner of that pyramid as the sunlight hits it, it casts a shadow. Notice over there to the left, the bumpy shadow or like a serpent or a dragon descending from the heavens because down at the bottom is a big dragon's head with feathers on it with its mouth open. That's Quetzalcoatl. That's Kukulkan. 
cuckoo, right? From chickens, cuckoo. That's where they get it from, the feathered serpent. Who's the serpent? This is a picture of Satan. And I guarantee you, according to the Bible, he's not gliding down from heaven, descending. He's thrown out of heaven. He's falling from heaven. That's the meaning of it. And it's based upon, remember what I said, Jesus comes from the east, goes to the west. So every day, the son who is Christ, Malachi chapter four, you've got other references in the Bible, Matthew 17, Jesus face shining like the sun. The sun rises in the east, goes to the west. Every day, it's a picture of Christ rising from the dead. When the sun goes down, it's a picture of his death, burial. His de he descended to the heart of the earth. Then he rose again on the third day. Every day. The book of Lamentations tells us that God's mercy toward us is new, brand new every day. The New Testament tells us that the inner man is renewed daily. And it's with the rising of the sun. You see, the, the devil didn't invent the sunrise and the sunset. God did to show us resurrection. But then God's so smart that not only did he have the sun rising up and going down every day, he had it rising up and going down every year. You've heard me teach on this. This is, I love this. It starts out in the south with the southern tropic, 23 degrees below the equator. Hmm. Then it rises to the equator. That's the spring equinox. And it rises again to the northern tropic line, which is 23 and a little bit of change above the equator. So from the southern tropic to the northern tropic, the sun has risen a little bit over 46 degrees. How long did it take for him to build the temple? 40 and six years. The two pillars in front of Solomon's temple were both 23 cubits tall, 46, right? Okay. The number of boards in the wilderness tabernacle, 20 down the north, 20 down the south, six across the back, 46, 46 chromosomes, these crosses that we have in our bodies. All of it is a, we have Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ is no longer the dying God. He has already, I am he that was dead and am now alive, he said. He's not still dying. But just as the sun rises and goes down, it shows the Lord's death and resurrection. Just as the sun rises from the south to the north and then back to the south again, it shows Christ dying, rising from the dead every year. We show it when we partake of the communion. We show Christ's death until he comes. So what did the devil do? He took God's creation. Remember Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, not into night showeth language. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And the devil took that and he snatched it. And he said, I will be like the most high. So he took that pagan temple. There's only one day a year when that shadow works exactly right to fall, to make it look like the feathered God coming down from the heavens. By the way, there's 365 steps on this pyramid. Shows the days of the year. There is one day in the year when this happens. And it's at the summer solstice, June 21st. It's when the sun is at its most high position over the northern tropical line. 23, little over 23 degrees north of the equator. Devil's pretty smart, isn't he? You see, he had wisdom from Ezekiel 28, but his wisdom was corrupted. Now, remember, they made all these little images of serpents. They're at Kukulkan, the uh, Chichen Itza temple, and everywhere else they had these carved feathered serpents. Remember that? 
And remember I said there was a place in the Bible? Remember what happened when, Israel, when the Israelites murmured against God? They complained? And did God kill them? Yeah, he got mad and he sent fiery serpents among them. Then they cried out to God for mercy. And did God have mercy? Yes. So he instructed Moses to make a brazen serpent. Let's read it. Numbers 21, 6. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. And the Lord, verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. John 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The gospel was shown even in the Old Testament, which some people don't believe. Like Church of Christ, they say the Old Testament's not for us including some other pastors that I've heard of. Oh, that the Old Testament is not for us. And yet there's the gospel right there. They didn't have to touch the serpent. They didn't have to kiss the serpent. They didn't have to speak in tongues to the serpent. They didn't have to give money to the serpent. They had to look on it. Now, whenever you get bitten by a serpent, you don't pull out a crucifix and look at it and go, well, I'll be healed. This is a different type of serpent. These were spirits, devils. So the only remedy to cure that disease is the cross of Jesus Christ and the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. See, Moses instructed them, if you look upon it, you shall live. Now, some could probably say, well, that's stupid. That never works. That, that's, that's made up. That... Uh, Surely God requires something from us. All he asked you to do is believe what Moses said. And if they did, they lived. And Jesus said, that was me. Because the serpent represents our sin. He has the power of death. And so Jesus took on the form of his enemies openly on the cross, making a show of them openly, Colossians says, nailing them to his cross. So he's defeating the serpent and the power of the serpent, death and sin at the cross. And all we have to do is look and live if we believe. And that's the simplicity of the gospel, my friends. It's that simple. But in these pagan temples, like at Chichen Itza, they were killing humans up there. On that top pedestal, the 365th step at the top, they were killing people. There's blood running down that thing. Now, remember, they worship the serpent. And when Cortez comes over, they hear about the Catholic Jesus. So now, Cortez has got him in a hold. He's got him in bondage. He can boss him around do whatever he wants. He takes advantage of the situation. So does that Catholic priest. You bet he did. So now they're worshiping a different idol. It's still the same God. It's the devil. It's the idol shepherd. It's not the real Jesus. They're just calling him a different name. Instead of Quetzalcoatl, he is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Just like they did in the Bible. 2 Kings 18.4 He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and he called it Nahushtan. Now the word Nahushtan comes from the Hebrew word Nahash which means serpent. Remember, so here's what they did. Here's this symbol of Jesus Christ. And it was never intended that they should pray to it, burn incense to it, give money to it, bow to it, nothing. Just look at it. Just read it. Are you saying, Mike, that all I have to do is read the Bible and believe and I'll have everlasting life? Yeah. Well, that's not it. God has commandments and he told us to live by those. If we don't live by those, then we can't go to heaven. God told us 
that there, no, there is none righteous, no, not one. We've already broke those commandments. We're already doomed. And anybody, anybody who tells you that they honor God by what they do while they say you don't honor God by what you do or don't do, they've got a wrong idea of the gospel, my friend. It is faith and nothing more. Because the works of the flesh just don't cut it with the real God. But the devil sure does. He demands sacrifices. He demands money. He demands respect. He dem and, and he says, don't you ever question me. And God says, question me all you want to. They were worshiping the serpent and praying and giving, burning incense to it. That is a works salvation. And I think this is Hezekiah here. He broke that thing in pieces. He said, uh -uh, we're not doing this. This is not what God said to do. We're not doing it. God blessing for that. Isaiah 30, verse 6. Fiery flying serpents. Remember I said they were devils? Kukulkan, Quetzalcoatl. I believe they were real. I don't think they made this up out of fairy tale imagination. I believe that there was something that happened. And they saw fiery flying serpents. And they believed it to be their God. Now I think the idea of the white guy with the beard who was tall, I think that came from the idea of the giants that used to live down there and all over the world. Isaiah 30 verse 6, The burden of the beasts of the south in the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old, the viper and the fiery flying serpent, they shall carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. Isaiah 14, 29, Rejoice not thou whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root, whose, whose coming is it that is after the working and power of Satan himself? Antichrist. Where does the beast get his power? The dragon gave him his power his seat and great authority. Here you have Isaiah 14, 29. You have Quetzalcoatl right here. Out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice. A cockatrice was a lizard that had feathers on it. A and oh, incidentally, remember after um, um, Jurassic Park came out, the idea that the dinosaurs that used to live 65 million years ago, which is phony, they said, we no longer believe that they just had scales. We believe that they actually grew feathers and then became flying birds. So science had to change their image of dinosaurs because they apparently saw fossilized evidence that some of these dinosaurs had feathers. Just like the Bible says, flying serpents. There is, they discovered the skeleton of a dinosaur bird like a uh, pterosaurus, and they called it Quetzalcoatlus. Why? Because it was a feathered flying dinosaur. And they named it after the serpent god of the Aztecs and the Mayans. Imagine the Bible being right for thousands of years, and yet people still don't believe it. Yet the cockatrice and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. I guarantee you that's coming again. Here's what Wikipedia said about Quetzalcoatl and other civilizations. The exact significance and attributes of Quetzalcoatl varied somewhat between civilizations and throughout history. There are several stories about the birth of Quetzalcoatl. Get this now. In a version of the myth, Quetzalcoatl was born by a virgin named Shimalman, to whom the god Antial appeared in a dream. In another story, the virgin Shimalman concedes Quetzalcoatl by swallowing an emerald. Drop my hat. Not only... Does the devil before Christ invent this idea of a God coming down from heaven being the Savior dying God with a cross 
He also, in some of the places, and, and this is not the only one, has him born of a virgin. Now, where in the world did he get that idea from? He got it from the book of Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. See, he reads the Bible, but then he corrupts it because that's what he does and that's what he did. So here the priest comes off the boat. Ave Maria, singing Hail Mary. And they're going, who's Mary? Well, she was the virgin mother of this God here that we have dead on this, this idol here. Really? Because Quetzalcoatl was born of a virgin. Well, looks like we got ourselves a savior then, don't we? And they sold the goods to him, converted. And does the Roman Catholic Church have a stronghold in Central America, Mexico, South America? In fact, for the first time ever, we have a Pope from South America, a Jesuit, who bows to the idle shepherd and wears the Dagon fish hat. Oh, and by the way, where in the world do you think George Lucas got the idea for Anakin Skywalker? Now, I'm not going to spend any time with him today, but remember, young Anakin Skywalker was virgin born. He had no father. Dun, dun, dun. More about him later. Images of the flying serpent. Notice this one on the left. Here you have a man and the serpent rising up over his back, over his head. Some say this is an ancient astronaut. I don't know. But the one thing I'm pointing out here is the serpent rising up his spine over his head. That is, remember, I and others think that the South American, Central American, North American natives migrated from Asia down to the New World. And they brought with them some of the same symbols, some of the same ideas, and some of the same doctrines. So, in India today, you have Kundalini, the serpent rising up. There it is, the base of the spine, discharging his power into your pineal gland, putting you to sleep, but they call it waking you up. And now, that's what that dot is on the forehead, the spot on the forehead, the mark on the forehead represents, it represents satanic illumination by a false Jesus image. Jesus never said, I am the serpent. He came to take on our sins. Remember, he bore crown of thorns. He took all of our enemies onto himself. It's like... It's like the guy fighting the battle and he tells his buddies, you go on, I'll get them. And he grabs all of his enemies, but they don't know that when they grab him, he's got a bomb and he blows himself up and kills all of the enemies so his buddies can escape, right? Well, that's what Jesus did on the cross. He took our enemies that was against us, nailing them to his cross so that when he died, they died. Isn't that great? I love Jesus. Here's another image of Quetzalcoatl. Notice the shield that he bears and notice what's on it. A cross. Here's other images of, I mean, Mexico has Quetzalcoatl fever. Mexico has image of Quetzalcoatl everywhere. Notice here again, the cross. Again, from Secret Teachings of All Ages. In Anacalypsis, Jeffrey Higgins throws some light on the cross and its symbolism in America. He says, The Incas had a cross of very fine marble or beautiful jasper, highly polished of one piece, three-fourths of an L in length, and three fingers in width and thickness. It was kept in a sacred chamber of a palace and held in great veneration. The Spaniards enriched this cross with gold and jewels and placed it in the Cathedral of Cuzco, Mexican temples are in the form of a cross and face the four cardinal points. Quetzalcoatl is represented in the paintings of the Codex Borgianus nailed to the cross, 
Sometimes even the two thieves are there crucified with him. Here are three images of Quetzalcoatl. Well, some of them is what was mentioned in that, the Codex Borgianus. Images of Quetzalcoatl nailed to a cross, dying. Notice in the left-hand image, it looks like he's even got a spear thrust into his Drop my hat in the creek. Are you kidding me? The devil set this thing up. He's been setting up. The Bible told us he's been setting up false Christs for thousands of years. And is it any, and people have bought it. Is it any wonder that people by the billions are going to buy into the Antichrist. They're going to believe it. Do you know why? There's one reason why they'll believe it. Paul said it's because they love not the truth. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe the Bible. And they won't. Ever. So back to what Manly Hall said in Secret Teachings. Mexican temples are in the form of a cross and face the four cardinal points. Now, if we go back and look up these images of the cross. Remember, I said there's two religions. There is the religion of the free gospel. Then there's the religion of the serpent, which is always a form of witchcraft. It always is. And what is witchcraft? Number one. It's rebellion to what's in this book. Number two, it always requires a works. In the Wiccan religions, they draw a circle. And they have to get inside the circle, usually draw a pentagram in there too. Or a cross. And they face the four directions, the four winds, the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and water, which are opposites of one another, which are the principalities, the powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. What must a Catholic do when he goes into the church? Did God say do that anywhere in the Bible? No. He didn't tell us to do that. They tell them they have to do that. And when they see the image of Mary, they have to do that. When they see the statue of Jesus, we have to do this. When we eat the wafer, we have to do this. Why? Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Four times Paul telling us about another gospel, another gospel, any other gospel, any other gospel. The fourth kingdom. See, that false gospel of works that billions of people believe in, and especially now because of the internet. I'm telling you, the internet, I'd say most of it, a huge majority of what's on the internet is a big pack of lies. And I promise you, it'll come down to you're either going to believe what this book says, or you're going to believe what's on something on the internet that contradicts this book. God help you if you do. Because that's the setup. That's the subtlety of the serpent. Is to get people thinking that they're worshiping Christ. But they're not really worshiping Jesus Christ. They're not. So, John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Who? The whole world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him. Not worketh for him. Not pays him. Not offers him the beating heart of a virgin. On top of a pagan temple. Whosoever believeth in him. Should not perish. But have everlasting life. And so you see the issue of Quetzalcoatl isn't just an issue 
for those who live in Central America, South America, Mexico, the Native Americans. It's an issue that literally spreads around the world. Because as I said, there are people all over the internet who sit up on a pedestal and they invent fake sins. And then they love to charge you with their invented sins and say, you're not really a Christian because you do this or you don't do this. Remember, remember why God said in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I've encountered in all the years that I've been in the ministry, since God really helped me understand what the gospel really was, I've encountered quite a few people personally who have invented different gospels and invented rules that if you don't live by those rules, then obviously you're not a Christian like they are because it doesn't matter what it is. The people who go to church on Saturday, they boast about it. The people who don't have any kind of celebration like at Christmas time or Easter, they boast about it. They boast loudly about it. You know what they say? We observe Passover. No, they don't. Passover has already been observed for the very last time at Golgotha. But they boast about it. They invent sins like if your hair touches your ears, you're obviously not a Christian as a man. If you don't wear a dress, you're obviously not saved. If you watch television, you're obviously not a Christian. They invent rules. Now, some people like rules. I don't have a problem with everybody's lifestyle. But you don't make up sins. Charge everybody but yourself with that sin and then elevate yourself above them as if you're the only one that's righteous and nobody else is. There is still none righteous. No, not one. And the devil has convinced more than one smart person who claimed to be a Christian that they really were saved. But they had invented a false Jesus. And along with that comes a false spirit. And the only other spirit that you can have other than the Holy Spirit is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's the other spirit. And along with that, a works-based salvation. And I hate every one of them. I hate the false Jesuses, I hate the false Gospels, and I hate the false spirits. I'm passionate about one thing, the Gospel and what's in this book. At some point, my hope and prayer is, is that when you get to that place on the internet where God has con started con to convict you about the lies, that you stop and you put yourself back in this book where you belong. Because the deception that's coming is a strong delusion. And there's not going to be very many people that won't fall for it. And those who don't fall for the strong delusion, it will be only by the grace of God and not any righteousness that we have ever done. Stop boasting. Let humility overtake you, meekness. Have a quiet spirit and let God fill you and lead you with the spirit of truth. This is Pastor Mike. You're the reason why I do what I do and I love you. And I'm required to say things in truth and in love because I don't want to see anybody that I know 
burn in hell for eternity because they were deceived. I feel like I've failed so many people because they just won't believe what this book says. And I take it personally. And I'm going to try everything I can to get you to believe what's in this book and to turn away from the myths and the fables. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.